great. It's another base podcast. Hi there, Sam. We're back. Hi there, Eric. We are back indeed. Uh, it's been uh, six months since episode, was it seven, eight? I, I can't. I think it was five even. Five, yeah, maybe, maybe <laughs> it was five. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's not overdo it. Uh, uh, and we did a pretty good episode then. We had Amos from Tesseract yep. as a guest. Um, and uh, yeah, and people seem to enjoy that episode. And then we haven't done anything since then. And... Uh, yeah. yeah, but now we're but now we're doing something, and I mean, I guess the the goal behind this podcast was never to make it like a weekly thing, or yeah, but but maybe like once a month. I think we we said when we got started, maybe that's a good thing to to get back to. I guess. Yeah, indeed. And then things happened, and we've been both busy. Yeah, super busy. Life happened, as we say. Yeah, yeah, life. Life tends to get in the way mm. of of uh, things like podcasts and you know yeah. stuff, but uh, but now we're back. Yep, uh, with a vengeance. Yeah, to our <laughs> one big fan. Uh, this is your all your your doing, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, so so what is new since since I think we did the last episode late August, if I remember correctly. Yeah, late August, early September, something like that. I had. We had COVID in the family, so my wife, I remember my wife was downstairs with a fever. <laughs> she had both kids and uh, yeah, it was a was an interesting experience to say the least. Uh, but yeah, it was September, I think, or, or yeah, late August, early September, the released episode. And I mean, uh, there has been a NAM since, since then. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I mean... Nothing life changing has been presented, I think, mm. since since last time. I, I don't. I mean, there hasn't been anything that has made the community go bonkers, if you will. Mm. Well, I mean, we're going to discuss the topic anyway, but um, I, th- I think like instrument prices in general are just insane right now. Yeah. Yeah. Inflation and uh, everything like that has really made mm, things. Yeah, I mean, you see used used Japanese copies of you know Fenders and that kind of stuff going for uh, you know on, in levels they used to. Uh, you, you could find Fenders like actual USA Fenders for those prices. Yeah. Like people are asking. I mean, some some people are just asking crazy prices, and that's another thing. But in general, just prices in general are so bad right now. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I mean, it's it's supply and demand is one thing, and then there is the inflation, and yeah, and I mean, considering those old or older Japanese instruments, I think people are actually noticing how how great they are as well so i mean that's also a a factor to keep in mind that i mean the uh fernandez and hosco and all of those older like 70s bases are, are pretty darn good so i mean yeah. i mean pricing is always it's always a hard hard thing to discuss because if someone is willing to pay it then it's then it's probably a price right ain't it I mean, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, those Fujigen and Matsumoku, they're really good instruments, no doubt. But I mean, it's just the overall prices. I mean, I mean, I remember, you know, the the, the Squire Japanese Vintage, the JV series uh, of basses. Uh, for those not in the know, Squire did a limited run during a few years during the eighties. Uh, they, they call it Japan Vintage or JV, uh, and they're really high quality basses. Uh, I remember th- them going for f- five thousand, six thousand, yeah. like when I was uh, in high school, and now they're going for over ten thousand. So, j- just yeah. as an example. And I mean, at my old job, we had an old japanese-made fender strat from i think 88 i think they were made in the same factory as the square ones if i'm not mistaken i could be wrong don't quote me on that but mm. i mean it was an amazing guitar it was beat up beyond <laughs> beyond salvation yeah. but it was an amazing guitar and i mean if someone is willing to pay it then it's probably worth it but it's 
I mean, it's hard to see. I mean, I th- wasn't it just a few days ago that someone posted like a Rickenbacker mm. uh, replica or copy or yeah. what have you for like a, a pretty high amount of money in the Swedish uh, mm. yeah, I saw uh, that. Ba- base group? Yeah. And people <laughs> people were freaking out by how can you, how can you ask this much? Yeah. I mean, I mean, basically, you used to be able to get it like a classic Rickenbacker for. 15,000 maybe now they're yeah. like oh this new one costs like 30 35 yeah and i mean i i borrowed one a few years back uh, me, me and my buddy lucas we, we traded bases he borrowed my my dingwall five string for a recording and i borrowed his i got to borrow his rickenbacker and mm. i mean it's a cool instrument but i would never <laughs> i would never pay that amount of money for that bass because it's it's not my thing no. um, it doesn't suit me but yeah, yeah, the, I, I, the double truss rod—that's impossible to to adjust correctly. Yeah, and and I mean, I mean the bridge and the pickup covers and all of that. I mean, it it just doesn't resonate with me. It doesn't work mm. with my technique and the way that I play. I'm, I mean, I've been playing a P bass for over twenty years now, so it's <laughs> yeah, it's bound to have some <laughs> impact on my playing style. Um, Was it midnight which is, blue though? Yeah, that one. It was midnight blue. It was midnight blue. <laughs> That's also a, a an inside joke mm. uh, for those of you listening. There was a guy. Oh, you can tell the story. Yeah, there you was. Um, I think it was seven ish years ago on. Uh, we were having a discussion, or maybe a discussion, that's that's the wrong word, but um, a thread popped up on the uh, Swedish talk base equivalent Facebook page. I think someone was, had been very drunk. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> this guy was asking for uh, if anyone had a Rickenbacker for sale, and it specifically had to be Midnight Blue. Uh, and, and people just kept like trolling him and egging him on you know, <laughs> to, uh, yeah, to absurd it, results and it's become a meme in Swedish uh, bass player circuits yeah and he, he misspelled midnight blue yeah. Like, blue and yeah it was um, if you're listening sorry for making fun of you but it was it was pretty hilarious the, don't don't drink on facebook guys don't drink yes. on facebook it's uh, i mean and that that usually pops up on fridays it's pretty fun when like when you yeah. got that friday thread when someone is a bit too drunk and starts <laughs> posting about, you know, controversial. Yeah. Or there was there was a guy with the, the Dremel who tried yeah. to route his uh, his new pick guard on, oh, on a yeah, Friday oh, evening. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. To say uh, to say the least, it didn't work out. No, that did not work out. Oh, poor guy. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, guys, don't drink and Dremel. Yes. <laughs> Um, and so, been, have you been listening to anything in particular lately? Um, I mean, I, I'm a big big audiobook sucker, as you know, mm. and uh, I actually managed to get tickets to Mr. Ingve J. Malmsteen uh, in, mm-hmm. in Uppsala this summer. I, I figured, I've never seen him live, and you never know when he's coming back, or if he's coming back to Sweden, yeah. so I, I actually bought a ticket for me, uh, and one for... Mr. Emil, who's a drummer in Six Feet Deeper. Nice. So we're going, and um, I was like, yeah, I should probably do some research. So I actually bought the Anders Tegner's uh, unauthorized biography mm. about Ingvi, and it was a pretty sad listen. I mean, at first it was funny, all of the like stupid things they did, but then mm. just got, got sad. So I've been listening to that uh, <laughs> in terms of books, and then the new Bruce Dickinson album, um, mm. Uh, the uh, Mandrake project has been floating around in my uh, air, air, AirPods, no, well, yeah, headphones, yep. and uh, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, nothing, there, no, like big, like oh, this album is is amazing mm. moments. I mean, I, I've been enjoying that album, but no, like you need to check this out um, as of now. So yeah, what about you? Uh, Any new music yeah. that you've discovered? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, by the way, did 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 they mention anything about Svante Hendrisson? In the- oh yeah, 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 he, yeah. It was like everyone was featured, so mm. it was up until like 2011 or something. So oh. uh, lots of people nice. going by. Well, I mean, uh, I've been listening a lot to 
Caligula's Horse. Yes, yeah. that is the band name. Absolutely. Great um, band. Yeah, fantastic uh, progressive metal rock band from from Australia that I might. Uh, it's funny because the first, for my first reaction to them was, oh, this sounds a bit like Carnival. And I mean, <laughs> there is obviously the Australian connection there. But uh, yeah, uh, they just released their, their album called Charcoal Grace. Um, oh. Quite a nice album, uh, quite melodic, a lot of sweeping arrangements, you know, like uh, I'd describe it Mahler esque, maybe. <laughs> you okay. know, these big uh, soundscapes and combined with heavy riffs and chugging, and it's just, just a great album. Uh, they have like a, a concept, concept thread going through the album with uh, like. Uh, a suite of songs um, that you know translate really well to to uh, to to the album and uh, so it's a lot of like contemplative stuff not just heavy like very very slow melodic stuff uh there uh, <laughs> my absolute favorite track on the album is actually sales which is a ballad uh and it's absolutely amazing and a great production uh fantastic sound in general and just very competent musicians and uh, who know what they what they do and their uh, sense of scale and uh, you know ingenuity is quite nice. Nice. So that's basically what I've been listening to. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, I mean, the regular Eddie Medusa, of course. Mera Brenvin. Precis. Uh, ben, and we, we touched on the subject, um, and since this is, is the return of the podcast, uh, we're going to focus a bit more on one singular topic yeah. today. And I want to begin with the most controversial. What's the point of having expensive instruments, really? I mean, it's, it's, it's a topic that's probably will be discussed hundreds of years after we die, uh, still, yeah. because there's no consensus on it, and... I, I don't know that's at least here in Sweden there's there's a like a weird sense of pride I don't know how to describe it but people are so obsessed with oh I took this 2000 uh, Swedish crown bass and turned it into a bass that's better than any Fender and so on and so on and so on and I mean don't get me wrong it's fun to mod basses it's fun to improve your basses and there's nothing wrong with it but I think the discussion is very skewed because you, you rarely get anywhere w- with it. Uh, no. <laughs> because people are dead set in their you know ways and, and people don't really change, you know. If there's no. one thing you should learn about people, it's people don't change. Opinions change, but people don't. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and again, for me, to, to begin the discussion, for me, it's... I, I think... To me, it's a lot about psychology, you know. Uh, if you've been playing for a really long time, you tend to pick up on the small details that that, that make the difference in an expensive instrument, you know. Things like you know, the, the neck pocket on a bolt-on instrument, um, the fret ends on a fretboard, um, the ease of uh, adjustments, like adjusting the truss rod, adjusting the string height and so on. Those things are really easy to do. Um, and and just in general the the whole feeling of playing an, uh, an expensive instrument, a- yeah. and not to say that there are expensive instruments that feel like shit because I've had had those <laughs> yeah, as sure. well. Uh, uh, higher a higher price doesn't necessarily you know mean a better instrument in all cases. But what I'm getting at is, so I mean. I feel after, like, I've been playing bass for almost 30 years at this point, and when I pick up a bass, I can instantly tell, you know, in my hands, oh, this feels cheap, this feels expensive, this feels good to play, and so on. Uh, and again, it's not always about the setup or, you know, uh, the string height, the string action. It's uh, sometimes you, you just get that feeling, overall feeling of oh, this is a good instrument, you know? Yeah. I mean, there is something about weights that I've been thinking about because I, th- I think, think think someone posted about this a few years ago that there is this ideal weight that a cheap instrument 
Yeah. It, it's either it's either too light or too heavy. It's never it never has that perfect balance. Then again, there are uh, expensive, very expensive instruments who are, that are very light and very heavy. So that's um, th- that's like that's not an idiot-proof concept. However, I think that there is something to like the balance of expensive instruments that uh, come through in that regard. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about, you know, regarding expensive instruments, uh, is there is this podcast called Ultimate Guitar Gear here in Sweden. Mm. It's in Swedish, so, um, but they they talk about the curated experience about buying, you know, boutique yeah. gear and expensive instruments, and there is something to that as well, I guess. I've never ordered a custom instrument, or even, you know, waited no. for anything. Uh, all of my I think all of my bases are <laughs> pretty much bought secondhand, <laughs> yeah. uh, in, in a way. Or uh, like the case with my Attitude Limited Three, I never got the hard case and the case case cannon and anything oh. like that because no, the guy because the guy I bought it from, he bought it from Thorman and they kept everything. They just sent the base, <laughs> in, uh, and they kept like uh, I I don't know why, but yeah. So. Um, with that being said, when I got this bass yesterday, mm. I got got myself a new nice. uh, Yamaha Attitude Limited 2 in Lava Red. Um, I actually got the hard case and the case candy. So that was, that was a nice uh, experience yeah. to get. But to get back to, to the subject, there is something about that uh, aspect, you know, the curated experience about buying boutique gear that you don't get from buying a CNC made base that comes in a cardboard box and yeah. um, that being said i mean you can make uh, i don't know yeah you remember that i i i got a base for my colleague he found it in the dumpster in his home <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, i think it was a uh, rusta boss ah, you know the swedish nice. uh, warehouse it, it, it probably cost about a thousand swedish crowns which is about hundred bucks, I guess, when it was brand new, and you probably got an amp and a cable and stuff with it. Uh, but uh, he found it in the dumpster, and he gave it to me. I was like, hey, I found a bass. Can you do something with this? And I cleaned it up. I did a setup, uh, and it plays pretty darn good. It sounds sounds okay. The things that you that I noticed when I was setting it up was that, I mean, the tuning pegs were, were terrible. I had to, like, it, it took me, like, 30 minutes to get the strings to to sit in the tuning pegs because they were jumping around so it was a terrible uh, the hardware was terrible and that is something that you can notice pretty much instantly with with that cheap instruments that the yep. hardware tends to fail pretty pretty soon actually um but it's interesting because you mentioned the whole purchasing experience the whole you know the case candy and you know the accessories uh, and I mean, the internet is obsessed with the unboxing experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, again, yeah, you know, just just the first the first moment of tension and yeah. excitement when when you when you receive you know the gig bag or the hard case and you just there's always like a special smell. Yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> it smells like oh, new instrument, like new car smell. Do you remember? Do you, were you a part of uh, Club Nintendo here in Sweden? Mm, no, I wasn't. Up? No, I was a Sega child growing up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was this uh, for those listening. There was the, there. I think there was still this. Uh, the distributor for Nintendo here in Sweden, Bersal Abe, had a club that you could join for free or pay very little money for, and you could, you know, you got a you got a magazine like uh, three times a year or six times. It, it, varied and you could call in and get help with with the games that you were stuck in uh, and they always did a an ap- april fool's prank or maybe it was super play a different gaming magazine i can't remember yeah. one of them uh, anyways did that nintendo were releasing a uh, an add-on for the gamecube that was uh, supposed to send send out smells so oh, when yeah, you were playing Mario, this. so yeah, so when you were playing Mario Kart, you would smell the burnt rubber, and you were, when you were playing uh, like Zelda, you would smell the forest. <laughs> so, I mean, one day there will be an iPhone uh, add-on that will add the smell of the unboxing yeah. for you, <laughs> and, and the technology already exists. Uh, yeah, I've yeah. seen seen this. It just the problem is you just have to have like 
chemicals because yeah. I mean smell <laughs> smell is is all chemicals and you have to have chemicals they have to refill but it's possible and um, yeah <laughs> no but getting back to, to instruments and yeah sorry th- no no it's perfectly fine I mean we are we are going deep here no pun intended um, because we are playing bass and we always go deep. Um, no, but you know the, the whole experience and just knowing the fact that you have like an exclusive instrument, I think for me at least makes a difference. And uh, I, I bought a used German built Sadowski. For those of you yeah. who know, Sadowski is one of the most legendary uh, brands of all time when it comes to bass. Originally from New York City, uh, Roger Sadowski, uh, fantastic luthier, obviously. Uh, but during the pandemic, he decided to move pretty much his entire production, except except his uh, New York custom shop, to to uh, Warwick's factory in Germany, Mark Neukirchen. And um, I have one of those instruments, and like you instantly picked up on the quality. Uh, again, the small, the attention to details, you know, the flawless finish, uh, yeah. everything in its place, uh, the fret ends. The, Warwick has something called invisible fret line technology or something like that. Basically, their their fret ends are invisible. You know, you, you literally yeah. don't see or feel them. Uh, and and the neck pocket, I mean, I'm not I'm not kidding when I, I say you couldn't fit a hair in the neck pocket. Uh, and you know. You, Everything from from the um, from the tuning pegs, which are OEM uh, hip shot uh, uh, clones, basically, to you know yeah. the knobs they use to to for the pickups and the, and the preamp. Everything just feels, you know, well built and, and thought out. And again, it's the attention to detail. Uh, the prices for them new right now are around like thirty eight, forty thousand something. Uh, I bought mine for 25 I think and again once you reach that level and start to go beyond $2,500 uh, the difference I mean the, the the law of diminishing returns so to speak uh, yeah at a certain point you know, the, the difference is so minute you won't notice it anymore but again in your mind uh, you'll feel more comfortable with an instrument or at least I do and I think that's a big part of you know that that experience. Yeah, I mean, you you said something. I think you put the nail on the head there. Like when you go past a certain point in terms of pricing, you you really can't tell the difference between a two thousand five hundred euro base and a three thousand yeah. euro base. I, I think that's um, that's a very valid point um, to make. Like. Once you go past a certain point, there is re- very hard for someone to tell the difference. Mm. And yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah, no, but but uh, so so to turn it on said uh, discussion, we talked about this people buying. You know, we you often see this. Oh, oh, how can you pay forty thousand for a base when there's good bases to be had for a quarter of the price? And then you see people like modding cheap, you know, uh, China instruments with new pickups and new, 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 you know, bridges and everything like yeah. that. I think that has to do with the. F- I mean, one. I think people. Yeah, that's one one aspect. But I also think think that it's the uh, the people are all afraid is the wrong word. But you know, you don't want to bring out your very expensive bass. Mm. To, to your gigs, I think that's a fear that some people actually have, and yep. it's totally valid. I totally see that. Of course. Uh, I mean, I bring out my all of my instruments to a gig, except for the the Attitude Limited one that I've got, the Thunder Blue one, because it's it's a one of a kind instrument. Yeah. That's I mean, the affection affection value is that the word? Um, uh, is I think we call it sentimental value in English. Yeah, sentimental value. Yes, thank you. Um, it's so damn high on that base that I can't, I can't see myself bringing it out and giving it, you know, dents and stuff like that because it's so unique. Yeah. It used to hang for those listening. It used this base used to hang uh, in one of, well, one of the best music shops here in Stockholm uh, for close to twenty years. It hung on the wall, 
uh, and they went out of business back in 2019, and I actually got to buy it. I had seen it for 12 years, I think. When I first moved to Stockholm, like walking into that music store, I saw it on the wall. I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah. And um, I got to buy it. I, I mean, I've used it live. It's a great instrument, I, but I, I, I figured I'd, I'm going to use it just here in the studio yeah. because, I mean, if any of my other instruments were to get stolen, uh, it would suck. Um, sure. I, I mean, I guess my, my, my old Fender P has got the same sentimental value. But I'm not bringing that to pub gigs and and stuff like that. Yeah. It's it's for it's for nicer gigs uh, or sessions. But but yeah, I mean, all of the other instruments, it would suck, but they can be replaced to some extent. This one can't, so yeah. that's why I also got this limited two mm. um, nice. because it's very similar to my limited three. So I got yeah. you know, and I mean, I I get the fact that you don't want to bring your expensive instrument to gig. But on the other hand, uh, if you're a professional musician, that, yeah. that's expected of you. I mean, the risk of, of getting your equipment stolen will always be there. I mean, I, I have a slight OCD when it comes to my instruments. If I, if I don't like have physical contact with my instrument or sit within like a meter from them, <laughs> uh, yeah. I have to constantly check them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've had custom instruments and I brought them to show some people are like, oh, how can you bring your custom instrument to a show? It was like, well, it's, it's my custom instrument. That's it's, the entire point. <laughs> like it's a tool. Yeah, it's a tool. And I mean, we have smoke free bars in Sweden since almost 20 years at this point. Yeah. Uh, so the bass won't, you know, physically Re- degrade <laughs> yeah. in that way. Reek. Yeah, exactly. I remember. I mean, I'm I'm old enough to. Uh, I turned eighteen right a few months before, or uh, uh, like a month before the ban on smoking was was out. So I still remember coming home smelling like an ashtray. Yeah, uh, I was. Uh, I turned eighteen. You're born in eighty six, yes. right? Yeah, so I, I'm two years younger yeah. than you, so I never got to experience mm, that. That's right. And I can understand, uh, like in, in the US, people being bringing so-called beater basses uh, to like pub gigs and that kind of stuff, because uh, in some states you can still smoke in bars. Uh, and But again, if my custom instrument got a ding, I was like, so what? It's my yeah. instrument, and those are battle, battle scars. Exactly, and I mean, it, it's the same with cars. No one will, I mean, yeah. of course there are people who buy cars and just keep them in the garage and never drive them, but, mm. and I mean, that's fine. If you want to do that, if you want to buy a custom instrument and keep it in your home, then, I mean, it's up to you. Um, yeah. But to me, it's a tool that you need to use or that you should use and bring out on the road and uh, sure. I mean that's why they are made uh, and so for for me there's another another aspect um, and honestly like I've, I've never been well situated with with economics until very recently in my life basically mm. and for, for me the possibility of buying something expensive, you know, saving up and having funds and just um, it's it's kind of like for me, it's kind of like a point of personal pride <laughs> in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get that. After living like because after after I, I graduated from university, I lived I had a problems getting jobs. So so at one point I lived at I like I had basically a hundred bucks after expenses was paid oh, to live sh- each month yeah. so I've, I've been at the bottom of the bottom you know and and, and yeah. work myself up and now i'm in a pretty com- comfortable position uh, when it comes to finances um but again i'm i'm, I'm like i'm honestly considering spending like six thousand euros on a base <laughs> <laughs> and I mean th- that is that is a hell of a lot of money, uh, but again, w- once you reach a certain point in your musical journey, so to speak, um, you know what you like, you know what works for you, uh, you know the kind of instrument that would like help elevate you to new heights, and 
I don't know. It's. Uh, I mean, if you want it and you can afford it, and it doesn't it doesn't hurt anyone, yes. why not buy it? I, I guess that's the point. Exactly. And I mean, it's your money. Mm. <laughs> and if someone goes, "Oh, you shouldn't spend that much money on a base," why not? What what what, what am I supposed to spend it on? Cocaine and prostitutes? Yeah, because... I mean, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and. Because that's illegal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and for me, it's you know, it's either either a vacation or a new new PC, or or a new base, and those yeah. are the three things. And honestly, I'm fine taking a vacation in Sweden. I mean, I have everything I want in Sweden when it comes to vacation. So uh, going, yeah. I mean, especially since I'm living single and I'm not traveling with anyone. Like, I'd like to visit some places, uh, uh, but going there alone is just, eh, you know. <laughs> yeah, I totally, totally get that point. And I'll have a and nice I mean, base instead that I can enjoy for years yeah. to come. So, exactly. And I mean, expensive instruments are also an investment. I guess you could. Yeah. There is always that aspect. I mean. It's it's always sad to sell instruments. I I had to sell a bass to get this one yeah. that I'm currently sitting with, and um, I did a setup of it before you know sending it off, mm. and I filmed a just short iPhone video to the guy who bought it just to show it what the controls did, and I was like, oh, I don't really want to part ways with mm-hmm. this bass. Oh, it's it's so damn good. But hey, you got to do what you got to do, and instruments are always an investment. I guess. Did you sell the Dingwall? No, no, I sold the black uh, parts fender. Oh, ah, okay. The, yeah, yeah. the, the one with the mirror pickguard. Mm. It was really sad to to sell it, but it was the only one that I I could sell mm. to to um, you know motivate to sell. I guess you you could say. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't sell the old <laughs> the old fender. I can't can't sell that because I will get haunted. Yeah, of course. Uh, by my by my uncle. Um, and I don't, I don't want to sell the, the the Super P because it's a great instrument and I, and I use it. So I figured, okay, I'm not using this bass as much as I want to and yeah. should. And it deserves to be played. It's such a great bass. Yep. Might as well, you know. And let's not play. Yeah, again, you know, the. I mean, uh, uh, we're not saying you'll become a better bass player just by, by buying like a very expensive instrument. But again, but you are. Yeah, you are basically you are. I mean, <laughs> again, again, uh, a carpenter uh, who doesn't sharpen his tools, who doesn't have the best tools, w- will have a harder time, you know, doing his job. An electrician that does, doesn't have the right tools, you know, will have a more difficult time doing his job. And ag- again, you wouldn't put an old Volvo 745 in an effort race. F- no, F- no, no, no. F1 race, right? <laughs> No, and then again, I mean, you can always make things work, like a carpenter mm. or an electrician. I mean, you can always make things work, and it's the same with with uh, sheep instruments. Yep. You can always make them work, and we're not talking about making them work. And I mean, like I said, the sheep uh, Rusta boss mm. that I had <laughs> or had, yep. I, I keep it at work actually because nice. it's it's. I mean, it plays great. Yep, it took some setup. And some work but it plays great and it, it works but would i would i bring it out on a tour no because it would fall apart <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that's the thing with with sheep or instruments because there is always a compromise with sheep or instruments of course uh in terms of wood and like the carving of the body and the neck uh those 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 things are uh, are pretty darn solid these days because you got the CNC uh, machines doing the work and they do amazing. Uh, I mean, CNC manufacturing has made sheep instruments way better. I mean, when we were growing up, like the sheep squire bases that you could get, I mean, they were shit back in like the early 2000s. They were like terrible. However, these days, sheep instruments can play really darn good and like feel really darn solid however there is always a compromise somewhere yes and maybe the compromise is in like in the base itself like in in the electronics or the hardware or in the labor and that is always something to keep in mind like yes because (laughs) because nothing in this world is cheap 
and free. Yes, and that was actually an aspect I was getting at, you know, the whole moral aspect. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you buy a custom Fodera, you know the people building the base, they work under the absolute best, you know, uh, circumstances possible uh, in a working condition. S- same with uh, if you buy a custom Warwick from Germany, they have like literally the, the most state-of-the-art instrument factory in the basically in the world. Yeah. Uh, and you, you know the workers are well paid, you know, they have their their rights, their insurances, their expenses paid. Um, yeah, same with Dingwall. Yeah, absolutely. Like the Super P, it's like amazing amazing luthiers working there you know that the guys doing the paint jobs are getting proper protection yep. uh, same with the japanese yamaha that i've got yep. they got two same there like the factory is amazing um i can't i can't speak for <laughs> for like the the so, uh, the the human fact like how mm. but i guess they are pretty darn well protected in terms of like you know breathing equipment and stuff like that oh, sure but, um but yeah i mean that's an aspect that you need to keep in mind when you're spending a lot of money on an expensive instrument yeah. because because the money is going somewhere and not everything is going into the pocket of ceo <coughs> gibson sorry uh <laughs> yeah and you have the classic triangle cheap good or fast choose two yeah uh and uh, that is obviously the um the motto in this case uh, i mean okay so 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 to put this argument on its other other side if you always think that like, like that you will never be able to buy or use any product basically because <laughs> any product where you pay a premium you pay like you pay for the human suffering behind it basically yeah um but again um because the thing that people don't maybe don't pick up on is woodworking can be extremely toxic. Uh, there are very much there so. are some types of wood, some types of trees that have like trees that are literally like poisonous to to you know inhale or to work yeah. with. Uh, you can get and yes, any you know sawdust and you get dust lung yeah, or whatever absolutely. it's called in English. I mean, I work with a lot of wood chip teachers who are coughing their yeah. <laughs> their guts out every day because because of that yeah. and that's that's important to like keep yourself protected from yeah absolutely and you i mean it's never good to buy a clean conscience but uh, for me it feels better to know oh this instrument comes from a place that's you know uh treats their workers well on that that aspect Uh, and again once you reach a certain point if if you're dead set on a sound that you can't get anywhere else uh that's where the money comes in so to speak i mean yeah i've been on my musical journey now for like i said almost 30 years i started playing bass when i was 10 or 11 and i'm almost 40 years old sad to say the realization has hit me um (laughs) exactly uh sad but true uh, for those who didn't get the inside joke, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, I lost my track. No, what was I talking about again? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, you've been you've been on your musical journey. Oh for, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, and um, my my first love of instrument was Warwick, uh, and for some reason it, it's like it's a love love story I I can't seem to shake. Uh, I like my mind always turns back to Warwick, even though there are things with Warwick bases like that I generally wouldn't like. Like uh, we talk about this a lot. I like bases with wide string spacing, uh, with a few exceptions. Warwicks tend to have very tight string spacing. Yeah, uh, they're very heavy usually, and I I tend to like lighter bases, um, and like. So the sound they make is it's a it's a love or hate thing, in my opinion. Yeah. So like you either love it or you, or you hate it. Uh, but like there's just something about Warwick bases and specifically their neck through models. Uh, I don't like their bolt on models as much, but there's to me there's a certain kind of magic when it comes to their neck through models, like their streamers, uh, the thumb base, obviously, and I don't know it's. 
at the end of the day, uh, I always come back to Warwick. Uh, it's like you coming back to Yamaha, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's, um, I don't know, it's part of it is obviously nostalgia. Uh, we're both kids of the 90s, so to speak. And yeah. uh, Warwick bases in the 90s were quite quite good and like uh, yeah they they were they were the shit if you will yeah. uh, in terms of you know at least i mean like the they were the bases that you saw in magazines yeah. and you you thought like oh my god that's 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 next level yeah. that's not and i have so many like so many players i enjoyed when i was growing up like Stuart Sender, you know um yeah like ryan martini uh peanut um we have like Dirk Lands from Incubus. Yeah, uh, Ma- Marco Eetal on my behalf from Nightwish. Oh, yeah. it, it was yeah. a huge uh, like I was gassing for an infinity for oh, many yeah. years. Um because of him. Yeah. Because it was a huge influence on me when I it was like the reason why I actually started playing with a pick mm. from time to nice. time. Um Still haven't got that one down, but yeah. I try. And then obviously, like Jack Bruce. I mean, yeah. again, uh, you hear so much about Warwick. Oh, it's just a high tech brand, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but their biggest artist was Jack Bruce, who's yeah. arguably known for a very traditional. <laughs> and I remember seeing an interview with him in, in a Swedish uh, bass. Yeah. S- Swedish bass uh, or guitar magazine called Fuss. Sadly, yeah. not around anymore. But he he talked about his his equalizer, and he had a fr- he said my basically he said my equalizer is just like my mood most of the time. It's very grumpy, <laughs> so he has an inverted smiley face because he brings out the mids. Yeah, space. I, uh, and and it's funny because at the end of his career, he almost exclusively played fl- fretless. Mm. Uh, and I mean, fretless typically is not something you tend to associate with with rock music, except Bill Wyman of obviously played the first fretless in in the Who. So no Stones, <laughs> Stones. I mean, uh, too early. Yes. Um, it's, too, it's too early for you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and and again, uh, those you don't you don't expect those kind of bass players to to use a a quote unquote high tech instrument. No. Uh, but again it's it's what you make of it. Uh some of my best bass tones ever have has come from Warwick basses and <laughs> the, you know the classic, oh why don't you get a fender? Uh after after the gigs. Uh and, and then I tend to answer with, oh okay, so so you saw the gig like you came to see me see me play music. Did the bass sound good? I was like, yeah of course. Uh was I playing good? Yeah of course it sounded great. So then, what is the issue? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it's just people wanting to have an opinion about stuff. Mm. It's 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 the same with cars. Yeah, like my car gets me from point A to point B. You should have gotten a Volvo. Why? Right, and because oh, yeah. I've got John Stockman from Carnival. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. fantastic bass player and fantastic when it comes to you know exploring tone. And it's funny because uh, on their th- their first album, he pretty much had like a clean bass tone, not a lot of distortion, and then uh, and things went awry. Yeah, <laughs> and he basically became the the originator of like heavily distorted bass tone and, and that kind of music. Uh, because a lot a lot of new metal bands, because I mean Carnival kind of they were pretty much a new metal band in their first album. Um, but a lot of new metal bands played Warwick as well, so I think I think they got a negative like connection to a lot of people in the early two thousands. Yeah, associated with the new metal. Yeah, like tone, Limp Bizkit especially. Yeah. Uh, what is this Sam what Sam Rivers? Feel- What's his name? Can't, can't yeah, remember. I mean, great bass player, by the way. But yeah, but yeah uh, a lot of new metal bands used some POD had a Warwick guy and. Um, but it's funny because if you look at the 90s, you had bands like Fishbone, uh, Lawrence, oh, I can't remember his last name, Fish Fishburn or something. Uh, yeah. Isn't it the actor? Yeah, that's that's the actor. Oh, I'm, I'm mixing it up with something, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great bass player, uh, played Warwick basses ex- exclusively. And um, yeah, uh, they tend to be used in a lot of different contexts basically they're very versatile bases and 
I can understand why you know the the five string thumb is not for everyone. Uh, <laughs> no, it's it a, has a unique sound. It has a unique look. Yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah, and I think it's look mostly yeah. that people are are getting yes. off about. And, uh, People are very afraid of phallic-looking instruments. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, you don't want to be seen with a penis yes. in your lap. I, I don't know why. <laughs> must be something about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but... And, I mean, a good tool, a good base, you can use for everything. Yeah. I, guess, I guess that's one of the points that you're, you're making with the Warwick yes. comment. That, I mean, it's not just for you know, new metal, yeah. because that, that was a while ago. Um, they are great instruments, and if you want to buy yourself a Warwick for your tax return, then you should do that. Um, considering if it. that makes you happy, yeah. because that's what life is about. Make yourself and other people happy, yeah. I guess. <laughs> and again, you know the old adage, adage, uh, oh, you need to have a Fender in the studio, because that's the only thing producers can work with. Here's the thing, kids. If you ever hire an engineer and a professional producer, it's their job to make your sound work, not the other way around. Yeah, I mean, I think that's from that stems from people coming into the studio with subpar instruments yeah. and the engineer actually having a P bass that is nicely set up or a jazz bass or for what sure. have you, because that they've had for years that they know how to dial in. Um, it's the same with the same with the sans amp. Mm. I, 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 to me, it's uh, it's uh, very vanilla. I, I get it's vanilla. It's the uh, a buddy of mine said it best. It's the substitute sound, the Vicari. <laughs> you they know. Yeah. I'm subbing in a metal band. I've got my sans amp. <laughs> nothing against Tech Twenty One and nothing against the players who are using it. If I mean, they work. They work great. Oh. It's not for me. It's not my cup of goat blood. Uh, yeah. And people are, they, they know how to use it and know how to work it. And uh, and I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, but but yeah, I mean... They made it work. So, yeah, they make it work. And you keep that in mind when you're going into a studio, I guess. Yeah. Like, make sure that your instrument is set up correctly, exactly. that it's intonated, that you got fresh strings. Yeah. Then you won't be needing to use the. Then you won't need to use the engineers' PBs. Yeah. Um, and 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 that is another thing that I can get. But again, like never be, never be afraid to you know say, oh, this is my bass. This is how I want to sound. And I remember I did a recording a few years ago uh, in a studio, and the producer kept pushing me. It's like, oh, you gotta use uh, the neck pickup. It's more bass. And he put me into an entirely clean preamp. And that's just like, and it was—it wasn't actually a bass preamp; it was mic preamp. Uh, and generally, mic preamps are designed to, you know, be full range, pick up, you know, yeah. all. And all this, like, it, it brought out all the the treble regions in the bass that you literally have no use for. And I was—I no. felt very uncomfortable because, like, you know, this doesn't sound like me. And I'm sorry, but I'm like, I brought my amp. I had my Aguilar amp with me. You know, I, I knew what my regular tone settings for the songs were, uh, and they always sounded good, good in rehearsal. I, I knew they worked. Uh, so it's like, uh, uh, that recording never went anywhere, and I think that's because the engineer had, had a too, was too set in his ways, so to speak. Uh, to be fair, he was an educator as well, so there was like a, a studio slash uh, studio school. Okay, okay. So, so uh, he, he'd probably been taught a certain way. And I mean, it is common to have a completely clean bass signal when recording bass, even if you have an amp. Uh, but again, th this in this case, it wasn't even a DI box made for bass. No, you it was know, it was, yeah, it was a preamp. Yeah, mic yeah. preamp, and it's just brought out, you know, like the... 10,000 hertz sounds like of, yeah of, the, the fizzle yeah the fizzle <laughs> of like scratching a nail on a piece of glass basically and I was like yeah. not not to be that guy but like uh, I, I'm a bass player <laughs> yeah and I mean that's another thing that you can always you know when you're doing a session brings bring a DI box so that you can split your signal yeah. if you're like me and you're using you know pedals and preamps on on your board yep. make sure to have the option to send a clean signal to to the engineer because they always want that um or i mean 
I'm currently working on the new Six Feet Deeper album, mm. uh, and I'm doing the mixing. Nice. Uh, and I, I've recorded just a clean DI into the computer. I'm doing everything in the box yep. because that's how I enjoy working with with stuff like that. However, I could have just as easily recorded just my bass tone for my board because I know mm. how it works and what it sounds like. Um, but it's also part, like you said, studio etiquette. Um, it's, yeah. it's it's disrespectful to to uh, to your bandmates, you know, to, to the to the producer and engineer because I mean you have a limited time in the studio. It's expensive to hire a proper studio. Very and much to so. come to a session like completely unprepared is very rude, especially to your bandmates. And honestly, yeah. if you don't bring like fresh strings and another set of strings, you know, whatever you need to yeah. get the job done. Uh, and again, <laughs> don't go into yeah, the studio. Yeah, don't go into the studio because you're just wasting everyone's time, basically. Yeah. Uh, and. Unless you're paying. I mean, if you're paying the bills yourself, go yeah, ahead. Absolutely. <laughs> Waste everybody's time absolutely. if you're paying for everything. But but no, um, that's that's terrible I mean, to, this, to do. There's a classic, um, there's a classic uh, story about Stanley Clark and the studio once. Uh, he just brought his upright bass uh, because he didn't expect the producer to... To you know, uh, ask him to play electric bass, basically. So he's just he's yeah. just brought us upright. And honestly, for me, Stanley Clark is much more interesting on upright bass than he is on electric bass. But that's another story. But but anyway, the story goes. He uh, was like, oh, he, he panicked because the the producer didn't say anything about electric bass. So he just went out the studio on the streets. I think this, this was in Los Angeles. And it's like he grabbed the first guy walking along who looked like a bass player with a gig bag. <laughs> and, <I was> like, <laughs> and, the, and the guy was like, obviously, it's like, oh, shit, it's Stanley Clark. Damn, I get yeah. to see like a, a legendary musician in the studio if I just borrow, like lend him my bass. So basically, the guy had a, had a, an, uh, a Fender Jazz bass. Uh, it was poorly set up. Uh, completely dead strings uh, all the bad things but Stanley brought it to the studio and he made it work somehow uh, so because I mean he had experience recording obviously and yeah uh, but you can still hear here it's Stanley Clark um, but again those are the exceptions I mean again if if you get least I mean again Lee Clark wouldn't be in such a situation because he's a perfectionist yep. <laughs> uh, but I mean if those like those guys Nathan East you know will Lee or if they they got in that situation they would make it work because they're just that professional yeah they sure are I mean but most people aren't yeah. that's my point like most people that no. just play in a band in Sweden are are amateurs and they have a day uh, you know a, a daily job they need to need to do so um again exactly if you have a good a good instrument you know oh if, if it comes to it i need to change something and i can change the string so the string height you know you can do that and not hurt the recording process exactly so, so you, you know basically an expensive instrument is kind of an insurance yeah so yeah but to round things off i guess uh, cheap versus expensive instruments. If you want to buy an expensive instrument and you want to invest your money in that, then go ahead. Yep. Because there is something about expensive instruments that you will... And there is always the buyer's... Uh, what's called? Buyer's remorse? The, no, no, no. The buyer's remorse. The other... Uh, the, 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 the... When you, like verify and justify your purchase oh yeah yeah the, the, the yeah. endorphin release or no yeah <laughs> so, yeah yeah there, there's something bias oh, okay. confirmation bias oh. there's the confirmation bias mm. uh, that you're like oh I, it's expensive therefore it's it's great oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so i mean there is always the confirmation bias aspect mm. of buying an expensive instrument and again we're not saying that cheap instruments are terrible no. however they um, are <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting cancelled. Good job, exactly. Sam. Good job. Yeah, we're, back, we're, we're back not, on we're track. Not saying and, uh, cheap instruments are bad, but 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 you get what you pay for, and there is always a compromise somewhere with a cheap instrument. I mean, sometimes you can. I mean, you can find you can find a local luthier who can probably build an instrument for for a bit cheaper than your. Uh, than what it would cost to get like a more um 
acknowledge and recognize luthier yeah. like internationally i mean there is always that aspect you can always look into uh if you want to you know be be um it's not it's not yeah it's fair trade right fair trade mm. is the uh, yeah human yep. rights if you want to buy a fair trade instrument then uh there is always, there are always options, or you know, buy used instruments. Yeah. That's that's all also fun. But again, there is always a compromise with a cheap instrument. It might be in the build quality, or it might be uh, in the human aspect. Yeah. And this is not to shame anyone who buys a cheap instrument, uh, but when you're planning on like, I'm gonna invest the money into a brand new instrument. For myself, I want to invest money into this. Keep that in mind. Like keep keep in mind that there is always a compromise somewhere yep. with uh, with cheap new instruments. I should say yeah. because uh, you can make. I mean, if the instrument is over forty years old, then, the, then mm. you can't yeah. <laughs> you can't really think about the ethical no, aspect of something being built in the eighties. And I can just uh, to, to to end end my segment on it. I mean, I'm a big gamer. I'm a big PC nerd and I love like expensive keyboards and <laughs> yeah but, but like the difference between yeah, yeah. an expensive keyboard uh when it comes especially when it comes to typing feel you know the feeling and the sound of the the actual yeah. you know keycaps hitting the, the board uh basically it's the same same idea as yeah, expensive I love instruments that. I love that <laughs> I love that uh but to end on a positive note we're going to try to keep this a bit more regular um yeah we've had uh, we had some life uh, life happening in the background yeah uh but uh, to our only fan requesting more <laughs> podcasts there will be more we promise and not and not on only fans but yeah <laughs> exactly our only fan not our only fans but maybe we should start an only fans with just no that's not no, but, that's but just not. display like really expensive bases <laughs> and feet yeah. Oh, feet yeah, and that's a good, that's yeah, a good yeah, idea. Yeah, uh, only feet and fan and basses, yes. And not fan fret basses only, but. Ooh. Ooh, Ooh uh, yeah. That's, or I maybe we, we remove the pick guards of, of instruments Ooh. to show their show them in, in the nude, so to speak. Yeah, take off the strings yeah. one oh. by one really slowly, like, oh, Ooh. look at this dirty. Yeah, un- un- <laughs> unwind neck. The, the tuning peg, like, really yeah. slowly. We do, oh, we do bass ASM, bass setup ASMR. That's that's an idea. Lots, lots of cursing in that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, but yeah, good to be back, yep. Sam. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll have an, a new episode out. Yes next month or something like that you never know uh, um, I mean we could start a Patreon you know well that's a good idea that's an actual good idea uh, anyway Eric you don't, you, you don't get anything but <laughs> we can buy expensive yes, instruments and uh, <laughs> like if you want memes uh, that's what you get from me uh, yeah. but anyway Eric uh, nice catching up and hopefully we'll talk a bit in the future as well Yeah, we will. Take care, Sam. Until next time. Until next time. Take care. Bye. Bye.